Hey everybody, welcome to the Atheist Experience. We are live today is Sunday, May 21st, 2017. I'm Matt Dillhoney. Joining this week, Tracy Harris. Hey. And our special guest, Chris, Chris Johnson. Johnson. Woo! Hello. And people were cheering and other stuff. Uh, I have a couple of announcements to make, and I, we, we had results come back from a survey, and we're not going to talk about that specifically today, but I did want to thank everybody who participated because the feedback uh -huh. was very helpful, uh, both positive and negative feedback. Uh, you'll find out more about that as we, you know, consider and the board decides what they're going to do with it. Uh, but it would reminded me, back in the olden days, when I first started doing the show, the intro was kind of like, Hi, welcome to the Atheist Experience. We're sponsored by the Atheist Community of Austin, a nonprofit educational organization promoting positive atheism and the separation of church and state. But I stopped saying stuff like that because I've been doing the show for 12 years. Uh, but it turns out we should mention that the ACA is a nonprofit organization. You can find out more about the Atheist Community of Austin by visiting atheist-community.org. And there you will find uh, some other bits of information that people perhaps weren't aware of. And that is that we have a weekly Sunday brunch meetup uh, at Cafe Express. All right. the details are there uh, on the website. And a monthly lecture series. Yep. Um, and I, m I may or may not be doing the June lecture. I have volunteered to do the June lecture, and it'll be a talk about magic and skepticism where I'll be performing and talking about it. But there's a chance that we could have a special guest, and since I'm here all the time, uh, we'll bump me to some other week if that's the case. Uh, that's it for the immediate announcements. Hey, Chris. Hey, Matt. Hey, Tracy. Hello. Hello. What are you doing here? Chris has done the show before, by the way, and has been a friend of ours for years now. Yes. Uh, because you've been working on this project for years. Well, I mean, years, it, it yeah. finished in different stages, but uh -huh. you're continuing. So why don't you tell us a bit about yeah, it? Yeah, so uh, almost like five years ago now, uh, the idea for the book, the coffee table photography book, A Better yeah. Life, 100 Atheists Speak Out on Join Meaning in a World Without God, came to me, and I stopped through Austin, and I said, I have this idea. I really want to do this. And friendships were started and um, years later I'm back. Um, you know, the book came out, the film came out two years ago, the documentary film version. Can I do the? Yeah, absolutely. The, f the film version, the book version. The film now has been out for two years and during that time I've been traveling around the world, just uh, shown it in 97 cities on wow. five continents. Yeah. Wow. Super nice too. And Tracy's in it, Matt's in it. Great, like full color, like just amazing yeah. interviews and well, I'm just showing pictures. But, really been an incredible yeah, some journey. Great. Because I think, you know, I think that we as atheists not only need to combat harmful religious, religious ideologies, but we need to talk about how we do see the world. Right. You know, instead of just attacking, we need to say, this is how we view life. This is how, this is what it means to be somebody who doesn't believe in God. This is how we deal with the difficult questions. Because if we don't do that, um, religions do talk about those things, and we need to talk about them too. Well, and wasn't part of it just to combat that horrible stereotype that atheists mm -hmm. are negative, mm. hateful people who just like to tear things down and they have no joy. They have no joy and meaning, right? They have it is, no it's a yeah. common complaint. Joy uh -huh. and meaning right. in their lives, and that was the whole thing, joy and meaning in the lives of unbelievers living yeah. without God, and that was part of the point, was to show that you know, there's as many different meanings and joy to life as there are different people who profess a non-belief in God. Yeah. And, and it gives us responsibility, too, to create that meaning for ourselves. I mean, which, is a, which is a responsibility, but it's also a privilege. Yeah. yeah. And uh, today you spoke at the newly formed, uh, or and it's a couple months old now, Austin Oasis. Yes. Uh, and there was one question in particular that we had a conversation with <laughs> afterwards. Yes. I thought the question was awesome, and uh, we both kind of addressed it in different ways, mm -hmm. but then on the ride... You, you gave me additional information. Yes. Go ahead and tell them what that was. So the question, do you want to say what the question was? Uh, essentially, the question was from someone who had religious family members, and she anticipated that one of their concerns was that the hundred atheists who are in the book mm -hmm. uh, were somehow cherry-picked, like most other atheists might be miserable, but you picked the 100 that would give you know good <laughs> answers on joy and meaning. I'm glad they um, thought our answers were good. Well, I, we don't know yet because she, this, this was a, a question she anticipated from her family but hasn't mm -hmm. been asked yet. Ah. Right. And so I said that, um, that you know, everybody I interviewed, I, you know, I didn't you know, exclude anybody because I found them too negative. Mm -hmm. um, and then on the ride home. Yeah, I asked him, <laughs> okay, so there's 100 atheists in the book. How many people did you interview? Because if you interviewed 500 and mm -hmm. you, you know, 
how many people did you interview? A hundred. Yeah, yeah. one hundred. <laughs> He's batting a thousand. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, granted, yeah. you did select the 100 select them, before you yes. went to interview him. Yes. Uh, but I think it's it's kind of obvious that mm -hmm. this tired old canard of, you know, atheists can't have joy and meaning or that they're miserable or that they don't have good answers on these issues or that you can't have joy and meaning without a god. Right. This not only debunks it, but in a beautiful way, both photographically and with, I mean, there are some incredible thinkers in there who gave amazing answers. Uh, Tracy's in there. I was going to say, they make my joy and meaning look like crap. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's just, I was like, oh, I clearly have to work on my joy and meaning. And to be able to spread that <laughs> around the world to communities where I don't even necessarily speak the language, mm -hmm. but people get the book or they see the film and they think about their own life in a different way or the lives of their family members or friends or neighbors. I mean, that's an incredible experience for me as well as an artist. Yeah, you can find out more information about this by going to theatheistbook.com uh, where you can find out information about the book and purchase the book or uh, the, the film itself yeah. in, I think, both DVD and digital download. Yes, yes. absolutely. Uh, and I'm not just saying this because I'm in it. I'm saying that if I wasn't in this, this is the project that I would have most regretted not being mm. in uh, because this is important. Now, we, we take, this is a live uh, television program. We take calls. We've got callers on hold right now. We interact with believers and non-believers. We try to find out what they believe and why. Uh, try to have conversations. Sometimes it goes well. Sometimes it doesn't. Uh, none of us are remotely perfect. I'm the least one to ever even attempt to, to claim perfection here. But a lot of it centers around, is there any good reason to believe that a God exists? And I think that's important. I think it's valuable to talk about those arguments and the way to have those discussions. Um, I think everybody can benefit from that. Uh, but we also hear from atheist non-believers looking for bits of advice, or I'm new to this, or how do we go about living our lives? And as a humanist, um, these are the things that I think are important. Um, I, I, you know, I like the Oasis slogan of people are more important than beliefs, but I also want to caution that beliefs do in fact matter because mm -hmm. that determines what kind of actions you're going to take and that affects people. So, you know, we're not about throwing beliefs on the wayside. But it's one thing for me to sit here and say, oh, I don't believe in God. And it's quite another to say that doesn't in any way diminish my view. As a matter of fact, it may enhance and expand my view of joy and meaning. Right. Well, I didn't know if you, you had anything else other to say than, than write. Or, what's next for you? Where are you going after Austin? Well, I'm touring uh, all throughout the summer and into the fall. Um, uh, in October, continent number six will happen. I'm going to uh, Cape Town, South Africa to show the film. Six continents. Six continents. Only one left, Antarctica, mm. right? The most atheistic continent of them all. <laughs> yeah. All the penguins and scientists, right? Um, yeah, because penguins don't, definitely don't believe in God. <laughs> if you've ever watched a documentary on penguins... Uh, first of all, I thought of this today when you said this earlier. Mm -hmm. That may be one of the most solid evidences that there isn't a God who's wise about design. Because he stuck penguins down there in the ice where they have to stand, stand around huddled with an egg on their feet for months. Waiting for sun and food and everything. Yeah, yeah. Who designs that? Why does God hate penguins? <laughs> wow. Oh, yeah, well, really. he gave them fur. Yeah, so they're all sitting there going, there is no God, there is no God, Pen penguins. Yeah, um, but this summer I'm going to uh, tons of cities in the U.S., Memphis, Nashville, Pensacola, San Jose, Raleigh, uh, Reno, Las Vegas, Boise, all over the place. It's going to be a lot of fun. Is that all that available at the website, too? Yeah, the yeah, my schedule's there. You can come check it out. I'd love to see everybody at uh, the screening. This thing really took off. It, in a way that I wasn't expecting. I thought I would do like six lecture screening events and then go to something else with yeah. my life. And like I said, I've done 97 now, 97 cities. So yeah. who knows what's coming up next? And I remember when you sent your letter out, like asking who would participate uh -huh. and uh, no, one, no one knew who you were, <laughs> right? It was like, who is this person um, who is so polite and professional in his introductory letter? Uh, which was a big reason I felt comfortable participating in the project because I felt that you handled your introduction in a super professional, super um, welcoming and and polite and just very respectful, the Thank whole you. thing. And I, I appreciated that a great deal. It's been such a joy, you know, not only doing the project, but getting to know everybody involved 
uh, you and Matt and everybody that you know is here in Austin. It's been such a great experience for me personally um, to not only tell this story but also for my own life personally <laughs> to make new friends and just have this community of people that um, support me and support the work that I do. How do you feel like your life has changed as a result of this project? It's funny. Somebody asked me that earlier today as well, and it's um, it's really made me focus on what's important to me. You know, is is making a bunch of money important to me? No. What's important to me is doing work that benefits other people and meeting new people and having important conversations about what matters in life. Yeah. And you know, AC Grayling talks in the film, you only have 300 months in your life to do whatever it is you want to do, right? Because your whole life is less than 1,000 months. And it's scary. 300, 300 of them, you're asleep. <laughs> 300 of them, you're waiting in line somewhere. And so how do you want to spend those 300 months? And I think that really puts into perspective how you want to live your life. And that's really affected me in terms of what do I want to do? I want to help talk about these important topics. Yeah. And I mean, when you did this, there there was no way you could have known what was going to happen as a result of this project. Only God knew. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. we won't rattle off uh, <laughs> a, a bunch of names, but mm. just for the people who might be curious, well, is this 100 random you know, atheists that you've selected and everything else. Uh, of course, as we've already mentioned, the two of us were involved in this. But also, for my magic friends, Darren Brown's in here as mm -hmm. our pen and teller. Mm -hmm. uh, what other magicians did you grab? Well, there's a DVD, too. Don't forget to oh, yes. mention the yeah. DVD, which was like interview, Richard Dawkins, you know, live interviews. Um, um, Steven Pinker, Rebecca Goldstein, Pat Churchland. AC Grayling, Marion yeah. Namazi, uh, Jennifer Michael Hecht, AJ Johnson, Lawrence Krauss. And, and P.Z. Myers, Aaron Raw, there's just, well, there's a hundred of them in the book. <laughs> yeah. There's not quite a hundred in the movie. Uh, no, that's and yet, just a I think mm. that the movie was almost a perfect, like, condensing of the thoughts because within the thoughts in the book, there are a lot of similarities. Yes. There's only so many ways you can say, well, of course I can enjoy my life. Turns out there's, uh, you know, a number of different insights into how v people view joy and meaning. Right. Uh, but ultimately, I think a lot of them, we had similar ideas. We're similar beings on a similar planet. And, you know, hey, I'm, I'm going to enjoy my life. Uh, and I'm going to be the captain of my ship. And I'm going to decide what the purpose is. Mm -hmm. And But the film also, there's footage there from your journey where mm -hmm. you're at a castle, you know, a demolished castle mm -hmm. in Scotland that I think is gorgeous. And, and it's just phenomenal. And, and I'm not just saying that because Chris is a friend of mine. <laughs> But he wasn't when this whole thing started. That's what's so amazing. Yeah. yeah. He, he, he is a friend of mine in particular because he took on an incredibly important project that everybody else had apparently overlooked mm. yeah. uh, that I think sh should be more valued than it, even than it is. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, as somebody who debates the existence of God, I'm pretty sure we'll spend most of today talking about <laughs> that more than joy and meaning, but you never know. You never know. I'm excited to... Hear what people have to say. You guys want to take some calls? Yes. Let's As a reminder, this is a call-in show. The number appears uh, right above Tracy's name over there, 512-686-0279. Uh, and after the show's over, we get together for dinner. If you're in the Austin area, not only could you come to Sunday Brunch or the monthly uh, lecture series, you can also come and visit the show. Uh, there's, a, I don't know, a bunch of people sitting on the other side of the glass like the fishbowl over there. And you can come down and watch the show. It's not a ticketed thing. Everybody, we get emails. How do I get tickets to the show? Uh, you show up. You show up early because there's limited parking. Yeah. Very, very little parking. Uh, but after it's over, we go to Star of India Restaurant. Uh, the show is going to be on till about 6 p.m., about another hour and 15 minutes or so. And then we'll be heading over to dinner. And any atheist or atheist-friendly person is welcome to come over and uh, join us, have a conversation and some food. Well, so uh, we'll go ahead and get started. We've got... Uh, Josh in Buffalo, New York. Hello. Hey, you're on with Matt, Tracy, and Chris. How are you? Good. How are you? Doing pretty well. That's good. Um, yeah, I just kind of wanted to ask uh, why you uh, don't believe. In what? In uh, God. Who wants to take it? Tracy, why don't you believe in God? Well... <laughs> For me, a lot of the things that I was taught when I was younger started to unravel when I started doing more research into it. Um, I spent about 10 years kind of looking at it once once the uh, the origins of the Bible started falling apart for me. And I started learning more about that. That's when Christianity sort of bit the dust. And then about 10 years later, I had spent that time 
um, talking to people about their ideas about God, trying to figure out what it was I believed because my initial childhood beliefs I'd been taught weren't, weren't, didn't hold up. Mm -hmm. um, and ultimately, I couldn't really find a good explanation for why I would believe that there's something beyond the, the things in reality that I actually come into contact with and experience, like that concept that there's something more to it that I'm not perceiving or that is imperceptible but at work. Um, or the ways that it was being perceived are actually the same as not perceiving something. Yeah. Um, like the idea of answered prayer, for example, the idea that something happens that is or isn't what I want. Um, because either way, they say God has answered. Sometimes he says no. So I started to actually realize that the things that I was interpreting as God were no different than a universe without a God. And ultimately, I couldn't find a reason to say that there is something beyond the universe. Yeah, for me, all of the various God propositions I've heard have failed to meet their burden of proof. There isn't sufficient evidence for them. The arguments presented for them are uh, either fallacious or clearly fallacious or aren't supported by facts about reality. I didn't, I didn't know you. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say I, I've never believed in God. I've, I've uh, always been an atheist, raised in a secular household, and so I was never convinced. Any of the arguments that I heard never convinced me to start believing in a God. Josh, um, okay. Go, yeah, does, go ahead, Josh. Does that answer your question? Um, yeah, kind of. So, but I mean, wouldn't you say that we all have beliefs that we can't justify, like sure. on a deep level? Sure, but the we, question is, should we have those beliefs? Right. If if you become aware of them, should you keep them? Okay. No, like I'm talking about like claims that just can't be justified, not like the irrationality of humans, but just like the philosophical process. Like, well, if so, if you understand that a claim does not, and I won't say can't because I don't, I don't want to go down the road and pretend that we can, we can always determine whether or not something could be demonstrated. But if there's a claim and you recognize simultaneously that there currently isn't sufficient evidence to warrant it, and you accept that it's true, you are by definition being irrational. Well, okay, but th there are like claims like like other minds existing, like the past existing, like so. So there's uh, evidence. There, there's evidence for those, and while there may be problems, it's just pragmatic that I accept that. So here you could you could look at it as Occam's razor or the null hypothesis, what, however you want to view it. Uh, is it possible or is it not? Is it the case that I can't demonstrate that the universe didn't start two seconds ago and that I'm in fact the only mind? I can't demonstrate that. However, if I act on that, if I act as if I'm in the matrix or my, my memories are fictitious or whatever, what does that benefit me? I'm stuck dealing with the world that I actually experience, whether it's the real world or not or anything along those lines. Well, I would just like to add, though, what you're talking about is a situation where even if you took it as contingent, right? Like, let's say I accept, oh, I, I can't really know that this is, in fact, true. It's, but it is what I'm presented with. Would you agree with that? It's what I'm presented yeah, with. Now, wait, whether it's justifiable or not, it is the, what I am presented with. Like, I, I have this situation where it seems as though I have memories, whether or not those exactly. memories. Okay. Exactly. But when that I. The but, exact okay. same thing about my God. Okay, right? but here's the that. problem. Sure, you have to let there. me finish. I am not presented with a God. So when, when okay, I'm, so when I'm saying I believe a God, what I'm saying is I'm actually inventing a belief in something which is not right. presented to me that I am assuming is there despite the fact that there's no presentation. Right. I, I'm not, so yeah, so for you that, that wouldn't work, right? Like, okay. Like if, why if somebody why didn't is perceive, it different for you? Okay, because I actually do experience a God in that kind of way you're talking how about. Did, or how, what, can you tell us what you mean by experiencing God and how you determined that it's a God? Like, the same thing I already kind of talked about, right? Like, you can't, you, can you please ex explain to me how you know the world didn't come into being five seconds ago and how, that is, what that, evidence you have? Josh, there? that's not, yeah? that's not an experience of God. That's a question about whether or not you can demonstrate a solution to hard solve system. You said you experience a God. I want to know what you mean by experience a God and how you determine that it's a God that you're experiencing. Okay. Um... Like, I've, I've already kind of explained, but like... Actually, yeah, you haven't point. remotely come close to giving anything that would be, here is what I mean by I experience God. What do you mean by it? Uh, like, I just have a 
sense of it, a feeling of it. I know that's not going to be convincing, and there's going to be problems with that, and that was my point for calling. Sure, like, what, but I would like to know, okay, so you have some sense that you, for whatever reason, can't describe and won't think will be convincing. What is it about this sense that convinces you that it's a god, and do you think that that should convince the rest of us? No, no. I, I, see, I, I'm only talking about the rationality of specific religious beliefs for some people, just like you directly perceive uh, the world being real and it's, pra uh, you said, pragmatic, things like that. I feel like I can say the same kind of thing about my God. Okay, I, I understand what you're saying. Here's the thing. You and I, just, just the two of us, we're the only ones here. Yeah. We, we both experience reality, correct? E yeah. Okay. Well, okay. D a different, okay. I guess. Something's real, okay. You and I, are you convinced that you share the same reality that I do? That we exist and can communicate, we're both real within this reality? Oh, yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Now, we both have this shared belief. Yeah. Only one of us is claiming to have experience of God. Uh-huh. And your experience of God is, the closest you've come is just saying it's a feeling. Yeah. Okay. What makes you think that feeling is a God and not just a feeling. Um, what well, makes me think that? I, like the, the same, I, I don't know. Like I, 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 I'm not trying to make you angry, but I, it's the I'm same kind of thing. <laughs> I know, but you probably will be if I continue. Like I, this is the same sort of thing where you can't justify your senses being real, but you just kind of work as if they are and you can't justify it to anyone else. Do you, do you care if your beliefs are true? Yes. So, if you became convinced of something, wouldn't you want to actually explore to find out as best you could whether or not it's true? Yes. So, how is it that you have explored your feeling of God to confirm that it is in fact God or that it, you have a reason, good reason to think that there's a God? Well, I'm kind of admitting that there isn't a good reason for other people, but I'm saying... like I, I'm me, asking about you. Yeah, for me, it's just a properly basic belief that I just... Okay, kind of then, with. you know, so... Just for everybody who's watching, saying that God is a properly basic belief basically is an admission that it's unjustifiable, but you're going to believe it anyway. It doesn't actually offer anything to confirm it, and you might as well have just said, this is what I think, I can't prove it, and uh, what, what kind of conversation could we possibly have about that? But you admit we all have beliefs like that. No, I think it's disingenuous to compare the two, because... When you when you you have actual experiences of memories, I can give great details of the experience of memories that I have. I will totally acknowledge that I can't know whether those memories existed ten years ago or two seconds ago, but I have them and I can describe them to you in great detail. And I can actually be hooked up to, uh, you know, neurologically to be able to show that I am thinking and having memories. But what, what we're talking about on when you use God, you're saying that despite the fact that you are not presented with something, right, because you can't even describe it, and you're saying that it's well, a feeling. We all I have feelings. I the story of my religious experience. That wasn't really my point for calling. But, but if you're yeah. going to say that you are similarly, oh, I love the frozen graphic. If you are going to say that you are similarly... Um, comparing this to something that a person is, like, I'm confronted with it, and the question is, should I reject what I'm confronted with? That's what you're saying, is why wouldn't you reject the only thing that you're confronted with, it, even though there's no other options available to me? But with this, um, what you've described so far with God is basically moving toward a belief in something that you are not necessarily confronted with in a way that you have to then opt to deny, at least not from what you've described. No, for me, my my feeling of God is as real as that of the real world. Right, but having a feeling, what is a feeling of God? What does that mean? What is a sense of the real world? I don't know. If the like, sense, like, here's a sense of the real world. Like, if I punch this book really hard, I could break a finger and that would hurt a lot. That's a sense and, of and, the real and, world. And, 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 I'm not saying Josh. that I know. What I'm saying is that it's, it's, it's an experience of which I have no alternative options to reach for as an explanation. It's like it, it, it feels like pain, and I'm experiencing pain, and I know it's pain, but I'm not saying it's pain put there by God. You're saying you have this feeling. Okay, you have you have a feeling, I believe you, but you're saying this feeling is God, and I'm and Matt is asking, how are, have you come to that conclusion? And, and the thing here is, here's a DVD, 
Is this a DVD, Tracy? I, yeah. Is this a DVD? It is. So now we have independent confirmation from three people that we are apparently experiencing the same thing. And we can describe it in amazing detail. Is it wrapped in plastic? Yes. The, the, you know, with a cardboard cover? And does it have a picture of what appears to be Chris standing out, maybe at White Sands? And then there's, is that AC Grayling? Mm -hmm. See, this is the way we go about investigating to make sure we are not, in fact, delusional. How can you do that? With, how can you do right. that with your God feeling? Okay. So implicitly there, explicitly, you're assuming that those other people you're talking to are actually real and independent okay. observers. It, Josh, uh, we already acknowledged yeah. we are stuck dealing with reality. Are you denying that me and Tracy and Chris are real? Um, am I denying that? Uh, why did you call us? No. <laughs> right? I mean, it's okay. So then let's drop the absurdities of saying, well, you can't even prove you're real. What you're doing is arguing that a lack of absolute certainty means that everything becomes a faith-based position and it's all equally improbable or improvable. And that is simply not true. The fact that we have, for example, you see, are you looking at the screen? No. Oh, okay. Well, you, are, do you believe that myself, Tracy, and Chris are sitting here uh, doing a show and talking to you over a telephone line? Yes. Okay. Do you also believe that there's a unicorn in the room with us? Um, maybe. I don't know. I can't see. Maybe you have like a little uh, stuffed animal or something there. I, don't know. I mean a real, live, living, breathing, loves virgins unicorn. Uh, no. Why not? Well, yeah, because based on my experience of the world, I, I don't think something like that is very likely. Okay. What if I told you but I had a feeling that I called unicorn? Would, would that convince you? If, if you, if you, no, that wouldn't convince me. All right. Let me, let me finish, let me finish, let me finish, let me finish the okay. question. The fact that I have a feeling that there's a, that I'm calling unicorn here, should that be a sufficient to convince me that there's a unicorn here? Um, I guess it kind of depends on that feeling. You're taking something that's just like a material kind of thing and, and it's not like God in the same way. No, it doesn't it's matter if it's like God, Josh. This is about the primacy of experience. And if you're going to argue that because you have a feeling that you identify as God, that you are therefore justified in accepting that there is a God, then your argument okay. means that any feeling that you have you are justified. Well, it's be like saying that I feel like my spouse is unfaithful, and whether he is or not, because I feel like they're cheating on me, they are. I, I wouldn't believe those that. Are, That's not the way we those verify are all reality. Expanding from your properly basic beliefs, so like the feeling that your spouse is cheating on you isn't a properly basic belief. It's something that okay. I don't think there. that I don't think that the belief in God is a properly basic belief. Well, As a wait. matter of fact, I think the mistake you're making is taking the limited set of. We should have as few properly basic beliefs as are necessary. Right. If we're going to have any. Is that, a, is that a properly basic belief? You're, we're done. I just want to add one thing. My point wasn't to say that whether or not my spouse is cheating would be a properly basic belief. My point was to say that a feeling doesn't, doesn't, yeah. is not justification for, something, for accepting something as reality. I don't accept memories as reality because I have a feeling that there are memories, but I can't really... We also know how flawed memories them. are. I, it's right. that the memories are actually there, and, yeah. and they hit me, and it's like I can think back and remember things. And whether, that's the, whether that is what it seems to me to be or not is an irrelevancy because I have no other options to pull from. But I'm not sitting here saying I don't have access to the memories, but I feel like there's memories. <laughs> and we, we, we also know that memory, memory that is unreliable, that it's manipulated and everything else. But just for the other callers, out of respect for the audience and those of us here, if we've already acknowledged that there's no, con no way, we, we don't have a solution to the problem of hard solipsism, which most people that I'm talking to probably don't care about or understand. If you start going down the parade of how do you know that, how do you know that, how do you know that, especially after we've already explained that what you're doing is trying to make an argument that in, in a world where you don't have absolute certainty, everything is suspect, in order to imply that it's all equally suspect, when we are doing our best to talk about how we would distinguish between reality and a delusion, I'm going to hang up on you. It, it's a guarantee. The conversation will be over there because this parade of, well, how do you know that? Well, how do you know that? Well, how do you know that? has already been acknowledged. 
And of the four of us, the three here and, and Josh on the phone, three of us are talking about reality as we experience. We're talking about ways in which we can investigate to determine whether or not our beliefs are reasonable. And one of us is asserting that they have a feeling which they're going to call God, which they acknowledge they can't justify, and that somehow this is fine just because somebody else can't justify some other belief. Right. And there's a big difference between saying I'm accepting this DVD that I'm holding you know, and here it is, you know, and, and I'm going to accept what's presented to me and not reject it because I have no alternative but to accept that I'm holding it in my hands. Now, there might be something else going on, but I have no access to that something else, and so this is what I'm left with. Mm -hmm. The difference would be, let's say that this isn't here, and I'm saying I believe there is a DVD sitting here because I have this feeling that there's a DVD. That is, that is accepting something that you're not presented with and basically saying that because you feel like there, a DVD is there, that you're going to accept that even though you're not presented with that in a way that you would have to actually re reject what you're experiencing in order to... Yeah. to uh, and and as, a, as a closer for this, for Josh and the other people who fall into this particular trap, um, they will say... Yes, but God is a different type of thing than the DVD. Okay, fine. You believe that there's a God and you are going to exercise reason and good standards of evidence for determining everything else about reality, but you're going to put God in this special category. If God has put himself in a category that defies reasonable investigation, then not only do we have good warrant to not accept that he exists, but you're admitting that you cannot have good warrant to accept that he exists. It's not the fault of reason or science that it can't investigate the supernatural, that we can't confirm that your God exists. But if you're going to call in to specifically admit that you can't demonstrate that God exists, but that you feel personally justified because you feel it, and this isn't something that anybody can investigate or confirm, you're basically calling in to acknowledge to the world that you have no good reason for your belief, but you're sticking with it anyway. And I, I reject the notion that people who do that honestly care about whether or not their beliefs are true, uh, no matter how much they claim that they do. Yeah, and just to say, like from a communication standpoint, feelings are not, they don't, they don't really give us information about the outside world. They're simply an interpretation. They're mm -hmm. a personal interpretation of what's going on around us. So your feelings come from your own brain, and it's just your internal, it's you talking to yourself. It's not really giving you information. A feeling of fear may or may not be justified. If I fear for my life, I think Chris is going to murder me after the show or something. Um, that might be completely unjustified. The fact that I feel it isn't telling me anything about Chris or yeah. what Chris plans to do after the show. It's simply about my own interpretation of something, whatever has caused me to be afraid and whatever has caused me to think that you know, someone's going to, to do something like that. Um, but that feeling doesn't doesn't inform me about external reality. It's, it's just an internal yeah. response that I'm giving myself. Yeah, the, your beliefs, what you believe about something, what you believe about something is independent of the facts about that something. And what we're talking about is, do we have good reason to believe that your feelings about the facts are accurate, that your internal model of reality matches reality? And what you're saying is, it doesn't seem to matter whether it matches reality, because we can't prove that there is a reality, and therefore all, all feelings about you know, deities or whatever are justified. And, and by the way, if you follow Josh's thing down the path, anybody who feels is convinced that they experience another god, some god other than Josh's, they have to be considered justified as well. And so now you have multiple people who are apparently under Josh's model justified in believing things which we know, they can't all be true. The, the God concepts are in conflict, so they cannot all be true, but they could all be false. Anyway, we'll, we'll try and get on some more calls here. Uh, Daniel in Victoria, BC, thanks for waiting. Right. Hello. Hi. How are you doing today? Good. Good. Hello. Yeah, Hello. We're, we're here. Sorry, we didn't answer. Yeah. Yeah, um, this is my first time calling in. I've, I've, in fact, this is the first time I've ever uh, seen the program or listened to the program in real time, so it's kind of interesting. Um, oh, I'm welcome. A, a Wiccan. Yeah, thank you. I, I'm a Wiccan. I'm a, I'm a retired Wiccan minister. And um, 
one of the things that uh, we have in common, both atheists and, and Wiccans, or, or maybe even just neo-pagans altogether, is uh, we're quite often persecuted by the mainstream religions to a very great extent. Um, one of the reasons why I think we are persecuted is because we're different. Uh, you know, atheists are different from Christians and Muslims, and both Wiccans are as well. Obviously, we believe differently, or, or rather, we believe and you lack believe differently. Um, but uh, I'd just kind of like to explore some of that, that idea of, of why there's such persecution for, you know, minority religions, uh, atheists, uh, people of different philosophies by the mainstream religions. What is it? about them that means that they have to persecute. Is that a question or are you, are you asking to further explain your thoughts? Well, I guess it is kind of a question, yeah. I mean, I'm not an atheist. Um, I tend to have a lot of things in common with atheists because I don't believe in a lot of other different gods and goddesses. Um, but I do experience a lot of the same things and, and I belong to a lot of discussion groups and, and I find myself uh, using the same arguments that atheists use, um, well, and I get the same responses. I, I'm not sure specifically about what you think about what counts as persecution, but for me it's kind of straightforward. We are social creatures who are also tribal, who are lazy thinkers, who are fearful of things that are different. And so the safest thing you can do is to pick the people who are like you and make sure that they're supported and the people who aren't like you aren't supported. Yeah, yeah, I think that's probably pretty close. Well, but I also um, think that when it comes specifically, at least to, you know, certain brands of Christianity, I don't know, I can't really speak to all of them, but I know the ones that are most um, conservative, just as my experience with, you know, meeting people who believe differently, it turned out to be kind of destructive to my belief in Christianity. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea of encountering doubts and questions um, that, Honestly, I was not prepared for because the doubts and the questions that my church had put forward from the pulpit were not the real doubts and, and questions that I ended up being asked. And a lot of what they said about other religions, specifically I remember, you know, I'm not going to go into the long, long, lengthy story, but what my uh, pastor was saying from the pulpit about what Buddhists believe. Uh, I found out later, you know, this is not what Buddhists believe. And so by trying to inoculate me with disinformation about these other groups, what happened was that when I went out into the real world and I started to meet people in these different groups, I started to realize that a lot of the information I was given, if not all of it, was complete bunk when it came to this is what other people think. This is what this group thinks. This is what this group thinks. And it wasn't what anybody actually thought. And people were far more reasonable uh, than our church gave them credit for, but I think they counted on the idea that they could keep us isolated by saying you're in the world, you know, not of the world, and so you should just limit your interaction with these other groups, you know, and, and just listen to what we're telling you, um, read your Bible and pay attention and believe it's all true. When I encountered other things, um, it was, like I say, destructive, because if, you're, if your beliefs hold up, Right? Like if you're looking at certain beliefs, like in gravity, for example, it doesn't matter where I go or who I speak to, um, it's very doubtful that my belief that gravity is at work is going to suffer for somebody asking questions about it or trying to tell me that it's not so. But my beliefs yeah, yeah. on Christianity suffered greatly as a result of people claiming things that I went, then went and researched in order to defend and only to find that I was wrong and I had been taught something wrong. Yeah, and that's actually one of the things that um, is, is a real thorn in my flesh, as it were, is this, this whole idea of empty claims. Um, I mean, we get it constantly, you know, and, and you probably do too. People come on and say, you know, God is real because. Um, in my mind, it, it's absolutely ridiculous to make a claim of truth of something that you can't substantiate. I don't have any problems with somebody saying, this is what I believe, and, and I can't substantiate it, but I believe it because of blah, blah, blah. Why, why wouldn't you have a problem with that? Well, I guess it depends. Like, and 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 I suspect that you uh, would say, you know, how do you know your belief is true? Sometimes, to me, my beliefs, and I, I readily admit, I believe six ridiculous things before breakfast. Um, sometimes, my beliefs, it's not as important for them to be true as it is to, for them to be meaningful. And I'll readily admit that I cannot prove what I believe, yeah. and I don't think anybody can. 
Well, so, um, so, but, again, but do you think it's a good thing for people to care less about whether beliefs are true than whether they're comforting or meaningful? Is that a good thing? I think it depends. I think it depends on the belief. If my belief neither picks your pocket nor breaks your leg, then whether it's true or not may not be as important as whether it's meaningful to me. Yeah, but the, the problem the problem here, Daniel, though, is that you you have this belief, right? Uh, yep. let, and you came to be convinced of this belief for some reason, right? Yep. So if you are have a brain that is accepting of invalid, unsound reasoning that led you to a false belief, don't you think that's likely to make you believe other things that are not true? Yeah. Actually, and and don't you think that, the, you, that we act based on what we believe? Yes. So well, we doesn't do it that. doesn't shouldn't it matter whether our beliefs are true? The fact that you derive meaning from it, you might let's say, for example, uh, be convinced that uh, I'll just go with the easy one, really simple, that white people are better than black people. You might be convinced of that, um, and not care whether it's true, but it's meaningful to you, and yet that belief has actions that have consequences, and the reasons you believe that might inform other beliefs. And so if you have, it, it's like a calculator that's broken. If you're putting, you know, 2 plus 5 in and it's giving you 19, well, you might say that's still meaningful to me. But what happens when you want to put in 3 times 4? What happens when you want to try to actually get the right answer? If you've got a broken calculator, if you've got a computer that isn't, that doesn't have any fidelity in giving out accurate answers, isn't that a big problem? Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, yeah. And, and let me let me let me uh, let me give you like some of my philosophy on it. For one thing, I have always promised myself that if what I believe conflicts with what can be shown, that I will discard my beliefs. Ah, but that's and a I, misappropriation of the burden of proof. Basically, that is, I'm going to believe this until you prove me wrong. And under no, that, no, no, it actually. No, no, that, let me let me let me go a little farther. For instance, I was raised a Federation Baptist, which is kind of equivalent to your Southern Baptist. I was raised to believe that evolution was false. When I got to high school and started taking biology and, and loved biology, I found out that the creation things that I was told were wrong. Yeah, That's Daniel. Wrong. Daniel. So I just started them. Daniel, this example yep. is you believed something until such time as it was proven to be incorrect, right? Yes. Weren't you still wrong even if nobody ever proved to you that you were incorrect? I was. And if you made decisions based on that incorrect information, wouldn't that be bad? It might, except for, mm. let, me, let me say, I have some very strict moral principles involved as well. And one of them is... Well, if you don't care about truth and you care about whether they're com comforting, how do you know you have good moral principles? Well, isn't that a problem? <laughs> yeah. My, my main moral principle is do no harm. So if what I believe in causes harm to somebody, and, and yet I know that that's a pretty subjective thing, but it's all I got then I have to discard the belief. That's just the way it is. If I believe that whites are better than blacks and that is a harmful belief, I have to discard it. That's just what, if it you're, what if you're not convinced it's harmful? Well, and that's another problem, isn't it? Yeah, which is why instead of, instead of holding this view of I'm going to maintain my beliefs until there's reason to give them up, instead of that, you should reserve judgment and not believe something until such time as there is sufficient evidence to warrant belief. That's yeah, how the burden. You have, that's how the burden of proof very, should be applied. You have a very definite point, and and I, and I will admit that. In my case, I believe that the, my my spiritual beliefs, even though I cannot prove them, do me good. So they 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 have a benefit for me. They they connect me with my culture. They. They give me a sense of connection with my ancestors and my history. So well, they do give me benefit. I could buy. I could. I could say that I believe that Chris and I, as beings in the universe, are connected on some level where we can communicate without words or even being in the same area. That there's a connection between us, such that when Chris leaves, I can still feel him, and that might bring me comfort. But is it true? I think you're kind of mischaracterizing what I was saying about that. I wasn't suggesting that I can talk to people who aren't there. I'm well, well you, didn't, you didn't give a specific thing, and you used the word spiritual, which I, I yep. have no idea yep. what, what the hell that means, and certainly not what it means to you. 
but the 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 sure. issue is yeah. i nobody's proven that chris and i don't have this connection and if the primary reason for holding it is that it's meaningful to me and certainly i'm not doing any harm am i doing any harm by by that or can we identify any harm and so well, under your model there'd be nothing wrong with me believing that well and yeah, possibly it wouldn't be. I mean, like I said, I believe in... Except that if it's not that. true, isn't it a mistake to believe something that's not true? Not necessarily. And, and for one thing, I, I, I'm going to turn it back on you, and, okay. and I'm doing this intentionally, is that um, once you make the positive claim that it's not true, then you take on the burden of proof. Well, I agree. And you also take on the burden of proof when you say that it is true. You also take on the burden of proof when you say, I am justified in believing this because I haven't been proven wrong and because I, it doesn't do any harm. Can I ask a question? Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Do you think, um, Daniel, that it might be good, like, when Matt presents me with this idea that he can still communicate with Chris when Chris, Chris has left Austin, should I necessarily tell him what if i don't say to matt i don't think i think that's not true what if i said to matt i'm not convinced that what you're telling me is true right now wouldn't that be reasonable to not believe him but also not tell him that it's false i i think saying that i don't believe you is a very reasonable position when somebody else has made a claim they cannot substantiate Sure. I, and, and i think that's kind of what's being said here is the idea Why that don't you to say not that to yourself? believe mm -hmm. it until you're you're confronted with adequate justification. If it's justified for Tracy to say to tell me that she doesn't believe me, then it, wouldn't it also be perfectly reasonable for me to say I don't believe me? Yes. Okay. This is the thing we're talking about is at what point should you be convinced of something and it cannot merely be because I haven't been proven wrong and nobody's demonstrated that there's any harm in it. Well, do you also believe that beliefs are necessarily voluntarily uh, voluntary? No, I, I, nope. I, beliefs aren't voluntary at all, as far as I'm concerned. You don't choose, in any simple sense, what you believe. You're either convinced so or you're I not. Do believe, if I do believe something, mm -hmm. and I don't have a reason to believe it, but I still believe it, mm -hmm. and I'm still open to the fact that I'm that I could be wrong, mm -hmm. is that not also a reasonable proposition in that I cannot just shut my belief off? Oh, you cannot shut your belief off, but what can happen is someone like us could explain to you why you are not warranted in holding that position, yeah. and, and then you'll have no choice but to change your mind. Well, okay, but again, I may, I may agree with you, but whether I can actually change my mind at that point is, is not necessarily the same thing. No, 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 no. Uh, you cannot agree with me and not change your mind. You can, so like if, I, if you said, I believe that there's a, a spirit in all of us, something metaphysical, something that, you know, whatever. I, I don't necessarily know because we didn't get to the specifics of your belief. And if I explain to you why it would not be warranted for someone to accept that proposition, you cannot simultaneously agree with me and still maintain that. What you can do is either say you agree with me when you don't, or say you believe when you don't. But if you okay, are in I, fact, I, I, if you are in yeah. fact convinced that it is unwarranted, uh, I, I suppose you could also uh, be convinced that you don't need to warrant your beliefs. Yeah, I, I think I agree with you, and I was I wasn't understanding what you were saying. What I can say is, if you convince, if you give me what is a rational set of arguments. And I will agree with you that they are rational, but I may not necessarily believe that they are correct. Uh, then I will still maintain my belief, but I can agree that you are rational because not everything that's rational is correct. It usually is, but not always. I do you not care about being rational? So this seems to me to be an objection to we may not have access to truth, but we can make reasonable inferences that are more or less likely to be truth. Yeah, and okay. I don't, I'm, so, I'm not going to say that my spiritual beliefs are reasonable. Uh, why would you hold beliefs that aren't reasonable? Well, probably because I'm a religious person, and you know, and and you're an atheist. And yeah, but I I wasn't like, always an atheist. I used to be a religious person. And when it was when it became exposed that my beliefs were not reasonable, I had no choice but to give them up. Yeah, because I care about being reasonable. This is why I ask the question, do you care about what's true versus what's comfortable or what's meaningful? 
And your your In your position opinion. your position as stated earlier seems to be that you're you don't care whether it's true or perhaps reasonable. I, I don't want to put too many words in your mouth. If in fact you find meaning from it, I'm saying that if I can if it cannot be shown that it's false, and it provides me a benefit a spiritual benefit that I'm using spiritual in the very esoteric sense here. Yeah. Then I don't see a reason to discard it. And then I used the I used the example earlier that See, I used this to is the problem. Taken. This is the problem is you are willing to hold things until you find reason to discard them, when what you should be doing is not accepting them until you have reasons to accept them. I mean, isn't that every irrational belief? I mean, haven't we just described every single irrational belief when someone every unfalsifiable it? proposition you would have to accept in order to be consistent. Yes, but there are also there are also things that are not reasonable that we believe about each other that we choose to believe until they're shown otherwise. For instance, most people have spouses or partners and they believe that those partners love them and that they are faithful. And we may not have concrete reasons to believe that, but we choose to. I, I don't think, no, we, I don't we do. think that the, I do. We, yeah, you, you see how your partner <laughs> treats you and yeah. you can communicate with that person and you can also see how they act toward you and... Sure. Yeah, and Wait, you know, how many people? To, how many people have been wrong? I mean, people are yes, wrong. Yes, feelings can be wrong. Yes, and we can we can yeah. erroneously assess someone. But what you're basically saying is that's fine. That's fine if your spouse is abusive to you and you think they're no, wonderful. No, 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 I'm, saying I'm saying it's fine to believe that my spouse is faithful and loving until yeah. I'm shown up. Even if they're you, like you know emptying your bank account. <laughs> It's like, no, it, yes, this, saying, <laughs> this is what no. I'm saying. You have <laughs> evidence for the love <laughs> of your spouse. You're not making that up. There is evidence for that. You know, Tim mentioned sure. us that great quote about, you know, love without evidence is stalking. Yeah. Right? I mean, just because but you're believing the evidence and you're not seeing all of the evidence, you know, yeah, you can be wrong about your assessment. But what mm -hmm. Matt is saying is, isn't it better to be right? If your spouse doesn't love you and isn't concerned about you and isn't faithful to you, wouldn't you rather know? Well, yes. But <laughs> even though, even to... though it yeah. might be more comforting to go on believing that they're faithful and loving. Is it no, but you think Daniel, I wasn't saying... Daniel, Daniel, let me, is, yeah. it, is it possible that I could be neither convinced that my spouse is faithful nor convinced that they are unfaithful? Is that possible? That's a good question. Uh, uh, my answer is yes, if you think this is a trick question. But I, I no, was, I don't think it's a trick question. I think it's a philosophical question. Well, I, those are two different propositions. X is faithful, X is unfaithful. I can be unconvinced of either of them. And I can be yeah. unconvinced of both of them. Mm. Right. Yeah. Right? So now we start off with a position where I am neither convinced that my spouse is faithful or that they are unfaithful. You're... Yeah. Your view was that it's okay to be convinced that your spouse is faithful, even if they're not, if it's, if it's meaningful and et cetera. And my, my thing is the, the default position is to accept neither of them until you have evidence for it. And, w and you could, with acknowledge that you, you could still be wrong. I could have mountains of evidence that my spouse is faithful, uh, which by the way is an absurd concept anyway, but I could have mountains of evidence for that and still, in fact, be wrong. But I, I am reasonably justified based on the information that I have. So I have moved towards a positive position based on evidence. Yes. Okay. But if I don't have evidence for that, I shouldn't just accept it. I, matter of fact, I don't know that I could choose to accept it uh, or, or put forward that position. And certainly, if I hold that position, I shouldn't say I'm right or I'm justified in the absence of evidence either way. Well, what is your evidence? No, 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 in the absence of evidence for either proposition. So, let's say proposition one is there's a, a diamond the size of Milwaukee on Mars. And the other pro the opposite is that there is not a diamond the size of Milwaukee on Mars. I don't have any evidence either way for that. I can't accept either of those propositions. But if I were to say to you, I'm convinced that there's a diamond on Mars the size of Milwaukee, and I'm justified because it hasn't been proven wrong, and I find it meaningful, am I being reasonable? No. 
then why would you hold beliefs and advocate for beliefs that you just acknowledged are unreasonable? I, I've never once said that I believe that my beliefs are reasonable. No, but you think that you're justified and that it's okay, that, that it's a good thing that you believe something which, you may, which isn't demonstrably reasonable. Justification and reasonableness are two different things, however. Justification is, is part of what determines reasonableness, but that completely ignored my, my question here. Uh, I, I believe I am justified in holding my beliefs, but I am not reasonable. Okay. I, I, I have nothing more to add. I don't think there's anything you can say to that. I, I, yeah. Thanks for calling. Okay, well, thank you. <laughs> All right. Hey, um, I'm, I know we usually prioritize theists, but Ivan was good enough to help yes. us with the sound check, and he's been waiting for a very long time. Absolutely. Ivan in Scotland, thank you so much for waiting. Welcome to the show. Hi, Matt. Hi, Tracy. Hi, Hello. Chris. Thank you so much for having me. Hi. Thanks for calling. What's up? Um, uh, I just watched a bunch of your shows, and um, I really like your show, and I, I, I wanted to thank you for, for what you do. Um, I'm, a, I'm an atheist and I'm a scientist. And I, even though those two things sound like I'm a very reasonable person, um, coming from South America, as I, as I told you before the show, um, you, you do get a lot of, um, you know, uh, superstition. And of course, you have friends who are uh, religious, Catholic, you know, uh, or you know, uh, astrology, stuff like that. And, your show has to give me some focus uh, to sort of dissipate this fog of, you know, superstition and that sort of, you know, lift that weird uh, thing going on and that, that really focus on reality. So thank you very much for your show. Oh, you're oh, welcome. Thanks. Totally welcome. Thank you, Ivan. Is that it? Well, the reason I was calling you is because <laughs> okay. uh, I, I watched like... Uh, <laughs> I watch like, uh, I don't know, over a hundred shows of uh, the atheist experience on YouTube and you the guys would have some sort of conversation with some uh, theist and based on the way the conversation goes, I, I reach a conclusion and then you guys say something different. So I thought, oh wow, I reached a conclusion that I haven't heard you guys talk about before. So I thought that uh, I would offer you this, this point of view that I... That I, maybe you guys have talked about before, have, maybe you have said it before, but I, I just haven't seen it in your show yet. Sure. So, if you look back to, you know, thousands of years, or tens of thousands of years of, of uh, human civilization, uh, you know, you can think of the Egyptians or the Greeks or even the, you know, the cavemen during the Ice Age. Um, we have this huge mystery, you know, like the biggest mystery of humankind, I think, basically, which is the origin of the universe and, and the origin of humanity, you know, and they would look up at the sky and look at the sun and look at the moon and look at the stars. And I think very early on, like really early on, the answer was God, you know, like, oh, a God did it or, or many gods did it. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, what are the odds that those people who were very primitive, you know, very ignorant compared to where we are now, they got the right answer, you know, for the right off the bat, you know, like for the first try, they got the right answer. What are the odds of that? Oh, okay, I see what you're saying. I, I, At first I thought you were promoting that they did have the right no. answer. I, I'm going to put <laughs> you on hold because there's some weird noise um, and we'll address this and then kind of bring you back on. So I'm going to put you back on hold. Uh, yeah, so what, what about this idea that, you know, we had these big mysteries and very early on, people said, oh, well, God did it. What are the odds that they got the answer right the first time? <laughs> right, right. Uh, for me, I, I don't tend to argue down this line for a number of reasons. Number one, uh, whether or not it's likely that they got the answer right the first time doesn't tell you whether or not they did or whether they had sufficient warrant for that. Um, and when you talk to religious people ab about this, it's not that they just invented a God. Many of them feel that this was a revelation, that God told them or told somebody else. Uh, we can't demonstrate that, you know, it was all made up. They have essentially propositions that we can't always demonstrate are wrong. Uh, so it almost doesn't matter how likely it is that they got the answer right the first time. Uh, what we, I think it's far better to say that they didn't actually, they, we know that they couldn't have got the answer right the first time because there were so many different first answers. Right. Yeah. 
It's, it's this spirit, it's that spirit, it's this God, it's that God. And so we know that some of them at least have to be wrong. Yeah, and I think part of it too, though, what's interesting to me is that children go through a phase of development where they perceive agency in non-agent things. And you'll see them express that in communication when, for example, a child might shut their door and like their hand in a door and they'll start crying and they'll say, it bit me, mm-hmm. right? Like when they're real small and they perceive that these things are kind of happening on purpose. The door is bad. They might go hit the door, right? Like they're angry at the door because it it's shut on their hand. And as they get older, they outgrow this idea that everything has this agency, that things are doing things on purpose. Um, and What I find interesting is that you have a lot of religions that are animistic, where they simply endow things, non-agent things, with agency, where you basically say there's a spirit in the trees, or there's a spirit in the rocks, or there's the rivers have, you know, spirits. Um, And when when the river overflows, it's angry. You know, we have to do something to appease the river gods, you know. And so you have this kind of animism that imbues everything with this agent type of spirituality and then when you end up with like a you know the god that we've got now this monotheistic system that is um, pervasive in the world in different religions uh, it's basically just this giant um, animism with the single god where it's like everything is endowed with with this agency so it's almost like a a belief from like a three-year-old that has come into adulthood where they're saying, you know, there's this spirit in everything Mm -hmm. and it's, it's all agent and it's all driven and there's a purpose to everything that happens. There's a reason that the parking spaces in the front were blocked off and I couldn't park there today. Um, And it's, it's just interesting that, that it's a phase that we all go through in childhood, but most generally you outgrow it and yet or, it's or you think of, you do or <laughs> I, I think people are fundamentally uncomfortable with the universe just doing things people want there to be somebody in control I think that's one of the reasons why conspiracy theorists think the way they do that's you know 9-11 couldn't be 19 guys with box cutters <laughs> with it had plane. to be right it had yeah. to be something bigger they say right so you know people feel like they want the universe to be controlled in some way. And mm-hmm. to not have that control makes people uncomfortable. So they think, invent so. gods and ideas. There that was a study that I talked about a while back that came out where they had a game that was rigged and people played this game and you had to get these um, little balls in holes. And in one of the versions of the study, they just let people put the balls in the holes normally. But in another version, they magnetically controlled the balls so that they wouldn't work right. And people didn't know it. Like the subjects didn't know it. And they recorded what the people said while they were playing the game, like kind of talking to themselves as they're playing the game and complaining about it not working or how hard is this. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot more instances of agency um, communication, like terms that were like, these things just don't want to behave. You know, they would say things that that had to do with agency whenever the game was not under their control. The harder the game got to control, where it seemed like the things weren't behaving like they should, And even then I just said, you know, they're not behaving like they can behave, you know. And so it was just kind of an interesting thing that that the more out of control people felt, the more they felt like they weren't able to control the game, the more they started to give the game agent Oh, I'm sure sure at home I have a box of video game controllers (laughs) uh, that I was convinced were agents and, you know, broke them and threw them in a box. Uh, the, la- the last thing, and, I, and I'll just chime in on this and then we'll make sure I haven't got a sufficient answer, is that one thing is, no matter what the first proposed answer was, no matter what, any appeal to agency uh, with regard to these big mysteries, every single time we've found out what is most likely correct, what is a reasonable answer, it's never been a god. And so they're, they're presenting these propositions that are unverifiable. Uh, and that, I think, is potentially comforting. And in some of the God proposals, the God hypotheses, the very fact that you couldn't possibly prove it wrong, or you apparently can't, um, may be comforting. Because if, you're, if one of your big fears is not knowing what the right answer is, if you propose an answer that, even if you have to involve magic or whatever else, seems to be sufficient for that as a causal explanation for that, 
and it has the added benefit that it's unlikely that it could ever be proven wrong, then you end up not only feeling like you have the right answer, but you end up in exactly the same position that our Wiccan friend was in earlier, where I now have an unfalsifiable proposition and I'm justified until you prove me wrong. And, but I want to make sure, Ivan, was that a, an accurate answer for your question? Yeah, I, I really liked your answer. I was wondering if I had a chance to make a last comment. Sure. Um, regarding the last caller, Daniel, you, you would explain something that I thought was very interesting, which is the broken calculator analogy. And I think it's, it's very true for the, for the viewers of your show out there. Um, what I told you earlier that your show gave me this focus on, on reality and, and reason. Um, ever since I started watching your show and, and this, you know, fog of, of you know, uh, superstition was lifted, I have seen the impact of that in other aspects of my life when using, uh, you know, being, uh, using reason and, and, and things that are not subjective. You know, so uh, again, thank you very much for your show. Well, thank you. Thank you. We, we, we really appreciate it. Thank you, Ivan. I, I like what thank Ivan you. was saying there about um, the inability to actually see the impact of the irrational beliefs until you start to withdraw from them. And I think for a lot of people who lost religion, um, who are atheists with religious histories, you do start to see just, it takes sometimes, I know, I know that I still worry that there are parts of my life that are still somehow um, impacted by the irrationality yeah. of what I was taught. And there were so, there were the first few years after my deconversion, there were so many things that I realized I was so biased about because it was what I had been taught. And you think to yourself, well, I'll get rid of this belief in the religion, I get rid of this belief in God, and then all of this just falls away, but it doesn't just fall away. You still go forward realizing like how sexist you were, you know, taught and how, um, you know, anti, you know, like homophobic you were taught. And I, I think the two biggest ones that awful. I hear from everybody, that even after being out of religions for years, particularly people who were involved in, you know, Christianity, Islam, major religions, are there's still baggage that affects how they view other people, mm -hmm. and there's lots of baggage about sex. Oh, gosh, yeah. And it's... So much judgment on th This people. is why when yeah. I hear something like this, oh, well, there's, you haven't demonstrated it's harming anybody. It, what, what does it hurt if, if you know, so-and-so believes that there's a God? Well, I think we can demonstrate quite a bit of harm that is directly due to beliefs and encouraging those beliefs in others. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, but like he's saying, there's so many tentacles to it. Yeah. So it's, it is like, it, it's not just, I mean, you gave the example of a broken calculator, but what if that three key is broken and everything you do with that three key is going to be wrong as a result and you don't even realize it? Like, what if you don't even know the three key is broken? Yeah, because the first couple the times calculator. you did it, you know. You hey. can't know how deep it goes and how, what, what other things it can be affecting until you start extracting it. And this is why I keep talking about, do you believe whether or not things are true? Are you willing to take uh, the sort of detailed inventory of your lives, of your beliefs, of the things that you are convinced of uh, with the integrity, the intellectual honesty to say, hey, maybe I don't have good reason for that. But if this belief is so meaningful to you and it's cherished, instead of sitting here saying, okay, well, I'm unreasonable with that, about that, but I'm going to keep believing it, why wouldn't you strive to go out and find out and attempt to verify it. Because if it's so meaningful, and you could be the one who could verify it in such a way that it would be useful to others, why aren't you doing it? Yeah. To me, it sounds like a, 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 an exercise in intentional self-deception. It's like somewhere you're like, oh, I'm terrified to find out I might be wrong, so I'm just gonna keep believing it until somebody proves me wrong, rather than caring enough to see if it proves you right. It reminds yeah. me of like the faith healers if they could do what they claim they could do, why the hell are they running around speaking to church groups and taking up love offerings instead of going to hospitals and curing everybody? Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, oh, because if you do that, all of a sudden we find out that you're a charlatan. I mean, and then, you know, if I'm wrong, prove me wrong. But that's, that's what we do. When we yeah. put things to the test, every single time we put things to robust tests, we find no evidence of the phenomenon. This is what the JREF did for years with yeah. the uh, 
million dollar prize. When I started to ask myself exactly what is it that I'm claiming I believe and exactly what is, why do I believe this? Like what is making me convinced of this? That was when it just became a search to get to the end where it was just like there's nothing there. And I remember you gave it an interesting analogy in the film where you talk about how it was like a surprise ending in a movie. Yeah. And I do, can you just yeah. tell that story? Yeah. Well, it's what I just said before that that you get to the end and it's not what you thought it was and suddenly you start going back. You almost want to go back and watch the movie again because mm-hmm. now everything takes on a different cast. And that's what I was saying about the tentacles. You know, you go back and you say, "Oh my gosh, you know, there was this situation that I attributed to God, and now I'm looking back at it going, why on earth did I attribute that to God? Like, it was such a mundane nothing thing, or maybe it was a unique or rare thing, but it's something that certainly happens. You know, like the one time we had a caller that was saying something about, um, you know, rare cures for people and how that, like, remissions were Mm -hmm. miracles from God. And I said, when you have, like, a study where you're using rats and a rat goes into remission, is that a miracle from God? And he was like, well, no, of course not. (laughs) I'm like, okay, what what can you say? (coughs) Rats Um, don't count. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Chris in Toronto, thanks for calling. Hi, how are you? Doing pretty well. Hello. I'm going to be Hello. in Toronto very soon, actually, the weekend of uh, June 2nd through 6th. Oh, great to hear that. Yeah, um, so I just called in to just, uh, I am a Christian, so just called in to share uh, some of my experiences that I've had, if that's okay. Yeah, Is there? A, can I ask what the goal is? What, to the goal of sharing my experience? Yeah, I mean, are you just calling to express yourself as a Christian, or do you, is this intended to convey evidence for your belief, or what, what is the meaning of, of the sharing of it's the experience? It's just for me to, uh, for me to show why I believe what I believe. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so I, I became a Christian, like a few, like, I guess now I've been a Christian for six years now. Um, and it's because of uh, experiences that I've had. Of course, I can't prove those experiences. I don't have, like, physical evidence that I can prove, but it's based on those experiences that I did come to faith, and, yeah, that's what I wanted to share. Okay, so what what you're saying is, to the best of your knowledge, what you're about to relay is your, your accurate account of the events as you remember them. Right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I guess you could just start by giving us, you know, one example so we kind of understand what you're talking about. But I will ask, uh, just be- I guess before you give this answer, whatever your answer, whatever your example is that that was sufficient to convince you or was part of what convinced you, do you think it should mm-hmm. convince anybody else? Like, do you think your experience should convince me? No. Okay. Well, th- I guess just go ahead and give us an example and we'll go from yeah. there. Okay, well, uh, an exa- Well, how I came to faith was uh, I was at a point where I wasn't sure, you know, I was just searching for truth. I wanted to know truth for myself. So I was just searching, and um, I was even uh, searching online, you know, like watching videos about, you know, experiences that people had of God. And I guess I watched a couple, and um, I watched this one testimony, and I it, it convinced me, right? I actually believed. Uh, so I that night I knelt down, I prayed, and within a couple of weeks, my prayer was answered. So uh, you know, it's sort of a long story. So I'll just cut it short. So I I didn't realize it then when it was answered that that was my prayer, but as time went on, I realized. Wow, I was pretty amazed. So that's that's that was the start of my journey into a spiritual life, and I've had so many experiences. So uh, wait, that I whoa, could... whoa, can I just ask a question? If I understand you correctly, yeah. what you're saying is that you you made a specific prayer, right? You you mm-hmm. you you made an, a request for some sort of intercession. It sounds like is that correct? A revelation. Okay, you know, and then in two weeks. God gave you a revelation that you didn't realize was the answer to your prayer. I didn't. I didn't realize it then, but as I as later on, I realized that was the answer to the prayer. What was, I, I think we need something yeah, slightly more specific. What was because, the revelation that that you had requested? It was just so that I requested that I know God. 
Okay, so there was no specific, trivia. there was no specific, um, just like, uh, no parameters to this. It was just an open-ended reveal something. What did you mean by no Yeah, God? I just wanted to know if God was real. That's right, but you I didn't say, about. like, let me wake up tomorrow and, you know, see whatever a, a, a no. dozen blackbirds no. in the driveway. Or so, it, so the prayer was more like, God, reveal yourself to me, and then sometime exactly. later... What happened? Something happened that you didn't realize was God revealing himself to you. And then sometime after that, in hindsight, you, you're now aware that that second event was God revealing himself. Exactly. What was the and revelation? What, what, what was the event? The event was, um, well, after I prayed, uh, well, I don't know if I'm able to describe it properly. It's kind of hard. I'm not really good with words. But um, I, I just... Uh, Basically, because I, I asked God to, to know him, a couple of weeks after, somebody like from my family, um, I don't come from a Christian family, like nobody in my family is Christian except for me. So like a close family member who's not even a Christian, uh, they asked they asked if I wanted to go to church. And I, 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 at that time I said yes, and it was sort of, it was a Catholic church, and when I went to the church, there was this uh, this prayer that you could say, you know, giving your life to God. So first I read it. I was a bit scared, you know, to give my life. I don't know what that means because I wasn't a Christian. I'm not a Christian, but I did, and then a lot of, like, I've experienced a lot of amazing things since, and I felt this this joy that I can't explain. So looking back, I'm like, wow, God answered my prayer. Like somebody who's not a Christian asked me me to go to a Christian church, and it was just, yeah, I, I definitely attribute that to God. Okay. And I can also. So, so you uh, asked for God to reveal Himself to you, and then somebody invited you to church, and you are now convinced that that was God revealing Himself to you. Well, out of nowhere. Well, like, uh, can I ask I a question? I'd like to ask a question. The person who invited you to church. Because they weren't a churchgoer, did they explain or give you any reason why they suddenly had decided to go to church? No, I didn't ask, actually. They didn't, I mean, but they didn't offer an explanation for, it hey, like I'm... like a church, like, it wasn't like a church service. It was more like a, you know, the, uh, it was more like a tourist church thing, you know? So there was like some kind of an event know. happening. There was like some yeah. festival or something occurring at this, at the, and they wanted to go to like this festival or something. Well, I saw Will Wheaton yeah. at an event at a church. I saw Chris Johnson at an event at a church. <laughs> yeah. So, but but yeah. What, whatever this was, and I'm, I'm really having a, kind of a hard time understanding exactly what took place. What is it that convinces you that it was God rather than just, you know, uh, a, a, an occurrence that happened without God? How do you tell the difference between when God is doing something well, or when your friend just after wants to I, go? It didn't happen before. Okay, but I said the so the, ooh, after this, the, therefore, because there's of a this. fallacy here, um, which has a Latin name, post hoc ergo proctor hoc, basically means after this, therefore, because of it. So the fact that something happens after another thing doesn't mean that it was caused by that other thing. Like I, I well, had, I, I had bacon, I, I had eggs and sausage for breakfast today. And mm -hmm. uh, I'm holding a pen. Me holding the pen doesn't mean it was caused by the sausage. Okay. Ni neither does whether or not I hit a red light. That, but. Ne not, neither is whether or not I hit a red light or whether or not the phones worked properly today. If I were to say, you know, I ate sausage this morning and all the phone stuff worked amazing on the show, therefore it's because of the sausage, we'd never accept that. Yeah, I... Right. And so, I, well, I, I want to just let me just interject here because, mm -hmm. um, Chris, let me just say that your story sounds a lot like how I got converted. Um, mm -hmm. When I was uh, in my teens, I was doing the same sort of desperate praying for some sort of sign. I really wanted to know the truth. And um, I had not been raised to think critically. And so one day, the preacher where I used to go to church, because I had quit going to church, called and said, I have this class, um, and it's about, you know, evidences for your faith, and I thought you might be interested, and why don't you come down? And so I came down, and I took the class. Now, back then, we didn't have the Internet. There was no way for me to investigate these claims outside of what I was told in the class. 
Um, it sounded very convincing, and I was young and non-skeptical, and so I felt like this was overwhelmingly, you know, evidence that the Bible was true and that God exists. And so, I, and also, I had prayed, right, and asked for God to to do this revelation thing. It's a very common yeah. thing that people are told to do: is you you go to God and you ask God to show you evidence of God, and then you pray until something happens. And then when mm -hmm. something happens that seems like an answer to that prayer, your prayer's been answered. Um, right. This is not uncommon. It's, it's actually the prescription for how they tell you to do it. Uh, they don't tell you to ask for something highly specific. They don't tell you that you should go and research um, and go and look and investigate to see whether or not a God exists. They basically tell you to do this highly subjective test with no parameters to just basically open-ended say, show me something. And then somewhere down the line, something happens. For you, it was like two weeks later, somebody said, let's go to this festival thing at the, that's happening at a church. And you went, and in your head, eventually, this became the, oh my gosh, I'm connecting this. It's an answer to this prayer. Um, that's how it works. That's how, it's built to function in a very amorphous, ambiguous way so that almost anything can fit into that answer. If it hadn't been that, it would have been something else, I can almost guarantee you. For example, but if, if I, I... Go ahead. I asked God to reveal himself, and he did, and he can do it in whatever way he chooses. Right? How, but what is, what, definitely... how do you know what a God revealing itself really is if you're willing to accept whatever you're, you're basically going to self-interpret as the God revealing itself. There was no prior uh, expectation of what it was going to be. Basically, it could be anything that you would be willing to interpret as the God in revealing itself. It's just, I, it's just a knowing. You just know that that's... How do you know that? Your prayer. But why is it... Yeah, I've. it sounds like you've experienced the same thing, the difference yeah. between... Me and you, I guess, it's because I choose to believe that it's from God, and you. No, I did. I believe. did believe that's, it was from God. That's what I'm saying. I did. I believed it, and I spent. I wasted a good, you know, more than a decade of my life chasing after this set of beliefs, this belief system that I then later realized was founded on this sort of, you know, un reasonable sort of testing and premises and why would you even buy into the fact that somebody tells you that this is a fact that this is how God reveals himself is there anything else on the planet that when you want to know whether or not it's true you go and you sit in your room and you just pray to it to, to reveal to you that it's true that's not how you discover the truth of things you go and you investigate and this is not investigation this is locking yourself away I can't away. investigate I, I don't think I can investigate. That's what they God, tell you. Do I want to? That's what they tell you, and that <laughs> is, and do you're I buying it. You, you don't want to investigate. You don't care whether or not you're, you're correct. You're buying it. You have bought and you have bought the story, the lock, stock, and barrel. I experienced it. I for said myself. the same thing. Experience. I said the Ask same thing. Who's had these spiritual experiences? It's experience exactly what I said. You. I said this for somebody. more than a decade. I was I could experience God and I felt God and I knew that I had a soul. I was convinced, convinced. And it was bunk. Why aren't you convinced anymore? Because I, mean, I realized like... that I was creating a special category of non-evidence that counted as evidence to me in this one you little cannot, thing. There is no physical evidence for God. He's not going to There's come no to any you evidence and say, for God. It's not just right. not physical evidence. There's no evidence whatsoever. What are you even referring to when you say God? What is it? What is what? Sorry. What is God? What are, what, are you, what are you describing when you God use is, the word? When you experience, you, you just know. He what is it? I'm not asking you to tell me when you experience. I'm saying you believe a God exists. What is it that you believe exists? Explain to me well, what it is that you believe exists. What it is, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure I understand the yeah, question. Yeah, because the question is meaningless, right? And that was what I ultimately, it took me 10 years to find out. And I, I, I apologize if I sound like I'm being somewhat frustrated here, but it's frustrating to me the idea that you might waste 10 years of your life on this. And so what I'm I, trying is, to do... I'm not wasting my life believing in something that I know is the truth. I know that's I've how you view it. Life, how, how, I totally understand. How do, you know, <laughs> how, how do you know that it's true? Because, for example, do you, do you realize that there are people who have, for example, lucky socks that they just know are lucky? 
Okay, I'm not gonna like compare socks to God. Okay, what, but, but I want to. I, 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 I really though. Either. I really want to get back to what I'm asking you, which is if you cannot give a definition for what it is you believe, then you don't really believe anything. If there's nothing there, if you can't what you, what define kind it, of definition, what do what kind you of mean? What are you, you expressing when you say you believe in God? What is God? What is it you believe? My life has changed dramatically. I'm not asking you about your life way. changing. I'm asking you, you say, I believe a God exists. Please define for me what God is. What is it that God you're saying love. you believe? Okay, so love. I believe in love too. So therefore, I guess we're in agreement that I God exists. I just don't see any reason to call it God. <laughs> I mean, I believe in love. Yeah, I don't, I don't understand why you would. I mean, so you're just saying that this well, is an emotion? If I, I pray, if I pray to love and somebody things, invites me to church, how does that confirm? I God, but I want to call that God. So emo the that's emotion that's love is what, you're, what you believe in. Yeah. That's, love, that's like everything. A, like, love is everything, basically. Well, no, it's not. What? Fire is not love. Fire is fire. <laughs> if well, you think that God... be love... It, Fire, fire can be mean? love. What does that mean? A park bench is what? not love. A blade of grass is not love. It's a blade of grass. It's a it, park it, bench. It depends on how you use it, right? If no, it's a, a, love, something positive, do, then it's love. If it's negative, then I would it's love to not. see one That's of those tests mean. that you have in English where it's like a bench is to sitting. <laughs> like, you know, I mean, I don't know. It's all love. Of course, it's not love. It's a park bench. A love is an emotion that you generate in your own brain. Right? And you're saying that this is what you're calling God, which if you, you could have saved us all a lot of time if you would have said that right out of the gate. You don't even have to pray for a revelation. We all experience love. So the only reason I haven't, I, mean, I God, haven't, the only reason I, is, Chris, Chris, the only reason I haven't hung up yet, uh, because you're giving us absolutely nothing and you're dancing around and God is love. And, and by the way, these platitudes of God is love or God is everywhere, they're useless. They don't tell us anything at all. But it says here in the notes that you woke up with Matt's name in your spirit. I wanted to know what that was. Oh yeah, I wanted to talk about that. So, is is your last name easy or hard for people to remember? Well, I think it's getting easier. I don't I don't really understand the question, and I haven't taken a poll of people. I think it's pretty easy to remember, personally, just as an outside objective person. Okay. I don't have trouble remembering your last name. Okay, so I'm not the kind of person that remembers even like people's first names, right? Okay. So when I, I when I first started watching the show, um, so I was watching the show and I stopped because I sort of got frustrated. Uh, so I stopped watching the show and one day I woke up with, I, rem I woke up with your name in my spirit. Only, I guess. What, what is my last me. name? Delahunty? Yeah. What, what, what does it mean to yeah. wake up with my name in your spirit? I have no idea what that means. That's what I mean. Like, it's not even something that I paid attention to, or it's not, I don't even no. think I could remember. No, no, no. I'm asking, name, so. I'm asking what it means to have someone's name in your spirit. I don't even know what your spirit is. I don't even know what spirit is. I guess you is. have to be a born-again Christian to know what that means, he was. right? I, I, I can't well, he that. was. Matt was a born-again Christian. For many years, he was, you wouldn't be an atheist right now. But okay, you're, 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 you oh. know what? I'm going to hang up on you, but I, before I do, I want to be wow. sure that I actually explain this to you. Uh, you're just talking nonsense and garbage, and you're talking about how certain and confident you are. You know you have the truth, and there's no way that somebody could be a Christian. I never and be, said that. You actually, you're a damn truth. liar because you did say that you know the truth, and now you're done. And you can rewind and find it. This thing about, oh, well, I, I believe in this, but I can't well, describe I, it. I, I, understand, I understand the feel. Oh, it, the, I understand that you are now convinced that you accept something, even if you don't understand the proposition. And you're so compelled by what it seems to be. You know, Oh, my life has changed since I became a Christian. You know what? My life has changed since I stopped being a Christian. Yeah. And, but the thing that gets me is that last dismissive statement, right? Yeah. That, uh, no, you were never a real Christian if you became an atheist. Yeah. And this is such a slap in the face to people who have devoted decades of their life to, to devoting themselves to this belief. Some of them worked as pastors and, and um, you know, you got Dan Barker mm -hmm. with the music, you know, writing Christian music. And these are the people The entire who, clergy project. <laughs> yeah, it's nothing but people who have devoted their lives to bringing other people to God. All and, of whom <laughs> could give a better definition of the God they believed in than you did. And it's just right. so frustrating to have conversations like that where you're trying to understand 
what she's talking about and what she right. means but I, by particular words. And then she just says things like, God is love. Well, what does that mean? But I have it, to say, for somebody that wasn't raised Christian, she used every Christian stereotype in the book. Yeah. And it's like, I don't know where you learned it. If it wasn't from your family, you learned it from somewhere because that's not stuff that you just get from nowhere. Somebody taught you this. And one of the things I talked about earlier was how they teach you fake things. They give you false information about other demographics and, and what those people are. And one of the false things they teach you is that a person who is an atheist could never have really believed this. And that is mm. such a bunch of crap. And it is a slap in the face to all the people who spent, I spent only like a little bit more than a decade, but there are people who have devoted multiple decades of their life to this 25 belief. plus right. years. And, don't, and some of them deconvert in their 60s or 70s and say, oh my gosh, I wish I would have realized this so much sooner because my entire life was blown on this. And the other thing that gets me is it's a way of saying I don't have to listen to you because yeah. you don't know. Mm -hmm. You were never really a Christian and if you say you were you're just lying and I just can dismiss everything you're about to tell me about your past experience and how it parallels my own. When she was yeah. talking she sounds exactly like I would have sounded when I was 15, 16 years old if I would called the show. I would so have given almost the same lines. There, there's a quick note I want to make on that call. We are we are at 6 o'clock so we're going to go over time. There's one more call that I, I want to get to because I think we can handle it pretty quickly, then we'll be going to Star of India. But I want to say this. There were several times where you could hear her almost laughing or smirking. And there is at least some portion of my mind that thinks, okay, maybe it's a prank call, maybe it's somebody having no. fun. But what I think was actually happening is when you see people who are, are, are guarded and on defense with regard to delusions that they are in fact struggling with, that sort of nervous laughter and condescension is exactly what you hear. Well, that's, oh, well, you, you wouldn't know. That's the inoculation, right? That's the shot they give you. You don't have to listen to anybody that doesn't believe in God because they never really believe. When they tell you that yeah, they used to believe, you can just forget about that. Just don't even listen. That What they have to say doesn't matter. It's their way of putting up those walls so that you never get challenged. Yep. I want to. I want to. First of all, I want to thank Chris, but also uh, we're going to do one more call with Mike from uh, Wadena. Thanks for waiting. Oh, hi guys. Hello. Hello. How and and I I apologize, Mike, because technically we are over time. Uh, not that we're extremely yeah. time limited, but I did want to get to your call and see if we could maybe address it fairly quickly. So if if you can, yes, I'll, I'll just go straight to the point. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I'm. I currently identify myself as an evangelical Christian, but I've been struggling with my faith a lot. And one of the greatest fears, you know, that I have in me is, you know, if if I become, if I stop believing, you know, you know, and if I'm wrong later, you know, it, you know if I die, everything I'm going to go to hell. So, um, what I want to know is how can I know for sure that my Christian faith is not, you know, real, and that yeah, I should just find, you know, I should just stop believing in this and just, you know, continue with my own life. Okay, so first of all, you're looking for a reason to think that you're wrong. And I think that's exactly backwards. What you should be looking for are the reasons for which you're right, and failing to find those, you, you couldn't keep believing. But if your primary concern mm -hmm. is, if I give this up, I, I risk going to hell, mm -hmm. which religion are you a part of? Um, I, well, I'm, I guess we can, I consider myself just as an evangelical Christian. Okay. Um, Have you spent any time yeah. worrying about the afterlifes from other religions? Are you worried about going to perhaps an Islamic notion of hell? No, I, no, I never thought of that. No. Yeah. So if you haven't spent any time worrying about, you know, hell from the point of view of another religion, and you're not sure that yours is right, what if one of those mm -hmm. other religions is right, and you remain a Christian, and you go to their, their bad afterlife? Yeah, exactly, yeah. I understand yeah. what you're saying, yeah. So if we're going to make this sort of Pascal's wager about what should we believe, we know that there are many different notions about gods and many different notions about afterlifes. And even within Christianity, there are different ideas. Soteriology is the study of what must, one must do to be saved. And there are, there's disagreement within Christian denominations about what you have to do to be saved. There's also disagreement about mm -hmm. whether or not there's a hell, whether it's a literal place or whether you simply cease to exist. And so mm -hmm. what you need to do 
is look at it and say, okay, here's all of these potentials plus more that I don't know about. Yeah. Should you work towards the best heaven? Should you work to avoid the worst hell? Or should you try to find out which one is most reasonable? And if it turns out that none of them have supporting evidence, then isn't the most reasonable position, I am not convinced of any of those. And if, they're in, if any of them are right, and that God decides to punish me for not accepting it because there wasn't sufficient evidence, then I am more moral than the thug who's going to punish me. I am better than that. I am intellectually honest and rigorous. And I, what, if, what if the whole thing is a test to see who's gullible enough to buy into Christianity? And then there's a God that punishes you for being too gullible. If you can't oh, okay. tell the difference between any of these, then you should not accept that any of them are true until there's evidence for them. And this is why looking for a reason that you're wrong is already starting off on the wrong foot. Oh, okay. Yeah, I understand what you're saying, definitely. I have a question, too, for you, Mike, um, because I know that what you're talking about, Matt gave you a really good, reasonable response, but you're dealing mm -hmm. with fear, right? Yeah. I mean, you're dealing yes. with fear, and yeah. fear doesn't always respond to rationality. So mm -hmm. I want to just ask you, if there were a God that would send, mm -hmm. let, let, let's say, you sound like somebody that really would want to know if there's a God mm -hmm. that wants you to know about him. Does that sound mm -hmm. correct? Yeah, exactly. Okay, yep. so you, you would be willing to be open to the idea of God. You would like to find God if God wants you to find him and God wants you to do certain things that are good and right. You, you're willing to do all of that. You're, you're searching and that's what you would like to do, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the fear is that if you don't do this properly, um, you could end up believing something wrong and then end up in hell, correct? Yes. Okay, and here's my question to you. Do you believe that this God, if he wants you to find him, would be willing to reach out and give you what's required if you made an honest effort to search for that God? If you really investigated, if you really applied yourself to looking at the, the explanations and the reasons, and you really critically went out and looked for this God for the evidence and the reasons that are provided, and you gave it a critical assessment, um, God should be willing to then uh, assist you if you're really putting your, yourself into it on that level, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, that would only be fair that you're doing everything you can, um, and so God mm -hmm. should want to make sure that you you know, that you get what you're looking for because you're applying yourself as hard as you can. So let's yep. say that at the end of this journey, you end up believing something wrong, that what you come mm -hmm. to isn't right, and that there is this God and there is this hell, and you then stand before this God to justify your life, and you say to this God, I devoted myself as much as possible, as wholly as I could, to trying to find you and to, to figure out what it is you wanted for my life and to do the things that you thought were right and good, and I worked as hard as I could to do that. Um, and that God says, yeah, not good enough, I'm sending you to hell. Mm -hmm. Is that the type of God that you would even want to be with for eternity? A God that would do that? Honestly... No, not really. <laughs> okay, so wouldn't you think that if God was really worth his salt, if he was worth spending an eternity with and worth, you know, wanting to be with, that it would be the type of God who would say, you came to the wrong conclusion, but you, you get an A for effort, and so you, you don't go to hell. Mm -hmm. If that God is going to send you to hell for investigating and working hard to find the truth, and ultimately the truth you come up with is whatever you come up with, right? But you applied yourself. In the end, yeah. if that God sends you to hell at the end of that, there is nothing else you could have done. You did everything mm -hmm. you could, and you were just dealing with a jerk of a God. Yeah. So you yeah, just, exactly. you, you should never be afraid to doubt. You should never be afraid to investigate. You should never be afraid to apply whatever criticisms you need to apply, whatever skepticism you need to apply. You go out there and you make an honest search and you look at the evidence and you don't be afraid because if there's a God that's worth being with, he's going to respect your effort. 
Uh, on that note, Mike, I, uh, I hope we've answered your question a little bit, give you some more thought to think about. Please call again another time, uh, but we've got to wrap things up. I appreciate the call. I have no interest in, in, in worshiping. Well, first of all, worship is, is <laughs> yeah. a, I don't think a notion I, said I reject. Worship, but no, being, no. if he wants to be with this guy. But I'm or, saying, mm -hmm. if God is the, the all, world's all-time champion of hide-and-seek, uh, he can't really fault people for not finding him if right. they see. Yeah. Right. On that note, I want to thank everybody involved in the show. Please you stop by and visit atheist-community.org. There's information there about the Atheist Experience TV show, Nonprofits Radio, our other efforts, including social gatherings, our uh, charitable efforts as well. And if you look around on the webpage there, there's a donate link so that if you like what you see on these programs and want to support our efforts, you're free to donate. We appreciate all of it. Uh, thanks to the studio audience on the other side of the glass and to Chris Johnson for joining us this week, Tracy Harris, and the people on the other side of this wall who are our producers who make all the technical stuff work out almost as if it were magic, but not actually magic. And we'll see you next week. This is Russell Glasser, host of The Atheist Experience. You know, The Atheist Experience is made possible by volunteers and the generous support of viewers like you. If the promotion of positive atheist culture and separation of church and state are values that you hold, please consider contributing by becoming an ACA member or visiting our product page at EvolveFish.com under the Partner tab. Thank you.